Amen. Amen. Precious truth, isn't it? That's why Jesus came, to seek and to save the lost. All humanity so desires to, to see people reconciled to himself. God loves people. Anyone else with one? Anybody else with one? Hallelujah. Well, for this week, 1 Timothy 4.16. This is one that we spent a little time on right at the end of service on Wednesday. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. 1 Timothy 4.16. And then, how about if we also assign 2 Timothy 2.15. In the King James, it is study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. These are good and familiar passages to us. They should be good and familiar to us. Take some time and meditate on them. Make sure that you have these memorized. You know, you read something over and over again. You may have never made a conscious and deliberate effort at memorization, but you will memorize it just through repetition. Amen? Amen? Certainly, certainly. It's God's intent that we would be a people diligent in our attention to the word of God. As we were finishing this morning, that we could be workmen that are very capable of all that he's called us to. Here, I'll ask the guys to come on up in just a minute. We'll be talking about the ministry of the Holy Spirit, among other things. And we, we know that there's plenty that the Lord can do. There's quite a lot that he does through his church, through the members of his body. They proclaim the gospel. They reach out to others with the love of Jesus. They reprove, they rebuke, exhort. They build up the body of Christ. We're workers together with him. Let's be good workers, skilled workers. Amen? Amen. Those who, by reason of use, as Hebrews says, amen? can make distinctions between good and evil. We've exercised ourselves unto godliness. Hallelujah. Well, guys, why don't you come on up and um, get things, uh, get to rearrange the furniture here for us, if you would. <clears throat> Very thankful to the Father for a great week at camp. Um, uh, look forward to hearing more testimonies. Um, how many um, had opportunity to pray with somebody to uh, commit their life to the Lord? They got saved. Maybe among the coaches. I know Marianne prayed with a, a young lady that was not um, playing basketball, but she came out with a friend. Anybody else? Uh, okay, good, good. Anybody else? With, anybody pray with any others, uh, adults or children, about any other needs that they had in their life? Steve, George, you're Greg and Aaron and Stephanie over there. That's Stephen Sands. That you're Stephen? No? Okay. Good, good, good. Thanks, guys. Um, <clears throat> good. Um, it's just extra special when uh, the people come on in, even this morning, talking with a, um, a parent of one of the young ladies. You can come on up, guys. One of the young ladies that was out at the camp. Uh, the, the parent was telling of how their daughter uh, was just so interested in coming on out, being here, uh, spoke of it just being such a special place. Uh, you just, you just, uh, the mom also was a bit of, at a bit of a loss uh, to describe the, the daughter's uh, expressions of enthusiasm and interest. Um, but um, really what they're speaking of is, is the presence of God, the, the love of the Lord communicated through the people of God. That's not something that, that folks just run into all the time and every day. No, that's the, that's the kind of exposure to, 
to the power and presence of God, the love of Jesus Christ, that, um, that is uh, sometimes in some lives, it may only be at a place like a, a camp such as we just conducted or coming into one of these services. And we hear those testimonies. And I'm just so thankful to the Father for them. I know I talked with more than one individual this past week who shared a similar representation, a similar impression. This is quite a, this is, quite, you know, just, what do you guys got going on here? I mean, this is, a, this is amazing what's, what's going on here. And he speaks of, he speaks of the presence of God that he is experiencing. The love of God, the, the joy of the Lord, the genuineness of the, of the care that people have. That's a, that's a manner in which the, uh, the love of God is communicated, isn't it? Interest, care, attention, respect. It's the power and presence of the Lord of glory. Amen. And people come on into this place and, and their lives are confronted with God's holiness, yep. his goodness. We, we often speak then of how people need to make decisions, and they do. We hope that they will make good decisions to make firm commitments of their lives to Jesus Christ. These are the kinds of things that we pray about, that the Lord will be glorified, move in us and through us, draw people, bring, uh, bring people on out that he is dealing with their hearts, that, he, that those that will be coming, he'll be dealing with them, convicting them, uh, convincing them of their need to, uh, to, uh, to fully surrender their lives to Jesus. It really comes down to that, doesn't it? Full surrender. Jesus is to be Lord. Lord. I was talking with one individual this past week, and uh, blessing, he uh, seemed to be a good brother in the Lord. He recognized that in religious circles, all too often you find that there are those that are ready to call Jesus Lord, but not do what he tells them to do. Would it be your observation that that's fairly common? Mm -hmm. Plenty of folks that I talk to, yep, Jesus, religious people, mm -hmm. yep, Jesus, not the Lord of their lives. Yeah. Continue to pray. Yeah. As we've said, uh, during these camps, the, the uh, two basketball camps, the VBS, we've come into contact with a lot of individuals, a lot of families. Uh, you've talked with them. Pray for them. Pray generally, pray specifically. Contact, for, uh, contact information for follow-up is available. If you need it, we can get it to you. Uh, come and, and, uh, and see one of us, and, and we'll get you a phone number so that you can make that follow-up phone call. Just reach out to them. The Lord is doing his work, and we should be doing ours as well. Amen? Yep. Yeah. Lord brought him on out. Gave us the opportunity to share the gospel with him. Let's allow the Lord to use us to bring some follow-up ministry as well. Amen? Yes. Amen. Well, we took some time there a couple weeks ago, and we taught several sessions on the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We didn't have our home fellowship group meeting, but we're going to have an afternoon, Sunday afternoon discussion about the topics that we've been discussing in some of our recent services. There, of course, we talked about the promise of the Father, didn't we? Yep. Referring to... Uh, the gift of the Holy Spirit, who Jesus sends, the Bible, uh, John's, John the Baptist's testimony regarding Jesus and the Holy Spirit is that Jesus will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. Amen. So when you get filled with the Holy Spirit, that's Jesus immersing you into the Holy Spirit, filling you with the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and uh, filling you with power from on high, from the Father, the promise of the Father, <clears throat> as the Holy Spirit is referred to, the promise of the Father. So all members of the Godhead involved. God promises the Holy Spirit. Jesus baptizes us with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit fills us to overflowing, doesn't he? Yeah. Took some time, and we certainly talked there. Took the whole session on, on a couple words from Acts 1-8, didn't we? Yeah. Uh, power is what? Greek word is? 
dunamis. And the uh, Greek word for receive is what? Lambano. Lambano. You remember those, right? Yeah. Power is that dunamis is the power power. And lambano is receiving, an active receiving, not seizing, wrestling, ripping it out of God's hands when he's reluctant to give it. No. But just like Jim the other day used the illustration again. He had Stephen on up, offers him basketball. You got to reach out and receive, don't you? God offers, but in order to receive, there's got to be some active exertion, effort on our part. The receiving is active. So if you want the Holy Spirit, ask God and receive. Actively receive. As a loving Heavenly Father, there's no good gift that he'll withhold, is there? No. If we being evil know how to give good gifts, how much more shall our Heavenly Father give his Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Who'd like to kick it off this afternoon? Who'd like to wade into it with just some of the, the points that uh, we might review? Well, one of the things that the... Uh the teaching of the promise of the Father did for me was to really challenge me on um, wanting to be refilled. Um, I have a, I've always had a strong desire to be a bold witness, a servant of God, but just realizing, just being challenged on how much do I really want it? Mm -hmm. um, because am I really, because I really do need, we all need to move beyond, you know, wanting to be a bolder witness, um, to be stronger for the Lord. Um, but Praying for it um, is something that I was challenged, challenged about. Mm -hmm. uh, just uh, praying and, and continuing to ask, um, putting it out before the Lord and really desiring um, his power, the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to um, not be timid. Uh, you know, nobody, as pastor said, nobody likes to call themselves a coward, um, but that's really what it is. And uh, as Pastor brought out the, the teaching that it's uh, the only thing that holds us back from sharing the gospel boldly is timidity. And um, uh, I surely don't want to be a coward. And um, you watch those old war movies, in which I like a lot of war movies. But, um, but yeah, there's nothing more disgusting than someone who's a coward and um, in the midst of a battle and a fight. Um, but just really knowing that God knew that we needed this, you see such a difference in the disciples from when Jesus was crucified and they all ran and forsook him. And then even after that, they were all hiding in, hiding in the upper room. Mm -hmm. um, they were, you know, afraid to answer the door. Um, but you see, once they were filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, how bold they were to come out, mm -hmm. even in the face of death, they knew that. And um, that that there was something, something changed in their lives. Mm -hmm. And it was that power of the Holy Spirit, that infilling, that they were baptized, that God knew they needed to be able to be bold witnesses, to be able to stand up in the midst of knowing that, hey, there's going to be persecution that comes. And persecution is going to come in our lives too. And, um, but I, I'd, rather, I'd rather please the Lord than please myself in this situation. Amen. Mm -hmm. Uh, they do. <clears throat> you no, know, it's interesting. A teaching like this, uh, for me, actually made me go back and really just focus on how much love God has for me. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because, you know, God sends Jesus. We read about it in John 14, and, and Jesus says, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. Amen. He was going. But just to reassure those people at his time, and of course all of us now, he says, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm going to send mm -hmm. another like unto myself mm -hmm. who be with you, dwell with you, but be in you. Mm -hmm. And I went back and looked at that verse that said, the love of God is shed and are brought by the Holy Ghost, mm -hmm. which is given unto us. And then I asked myself, wrote in my notes, if God is loving and gracious enough to send his son for my sins to redeem my life, why would I refuse the gift mm -hmm. of the Holy Spirit? Because Pastor brought that out earlier in teaching. Why would we refuse to, to accept that? We accept salvation. Father, we thank you for rescuing our lives and setting us on the, on the right way. But then he says, I'm going to endue you with power from on high. Why would I refuse that? It's, it's being given all the privileges, 
but not given the authority to use what you've been given. And from there, it, just, it was just a blessing to really see the love of God anew, afresh, to be stirred in, Father, thank you for your love shared to me through the Holy Ghost, Holy yeah. Spirit. And then also, when the pastor read through the Acts 1-8, it was really a sobering message to say, now you received this and you're gracious and glad to receive it, but don't just hoard it to yourself. You shall be witnesses. You shall go forth and be my witnesses. Mm -hmm. And it was a blessing because on Saturday, normally last day of camp, I'm here watching the games like everybody else. But again, the quickening power of the Holy Spirit is it's tremendous. For the first time in all years we've done camp, I actually went outside and stayed outside almost the whole time. And just looking for people on the front, on the side, in the back, and taking every opportunity that I could to share the love of God with whoever I came across, whether it's a child playing with, with a parent or some of the teams practicing. Just, again, being obedient to be that witness, that bold witness to those who were outside and not watching the games. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was, you know, it was a blessing because, again, it was, it, it's something I've not experienced before just to be that fervent in spirit to go out and share boldly mm -hmm. to all that were outside. And there were a good number of people out there. Mm -hmm. So it was a blessing. I was just so thankful for the obedience of the Holy Spirit to, mm -hmm. to quicken me, as it says in the scripture, but then for me to be obedient to the Holy Spirit's mm -hmm. leading to go out and share. It was tremendous. Yeah. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Father. Mm -hmm. One of the first things that Dad was saying when we started the series a few weeks ago uh, was along the lines of guarding against complacency. And he talked about how if we're healthy, a healthy Christian is a hungry Christian. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the things that the Lord did and continues to do in my life through these recent teachings was to challenge me to be stirred in... Uh, receiving the fullness of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and just living a life full of the Spirit. Um, I definitely testify to the fact that the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and I'm very, my flesh would like to just coast into heaven. Okay, I've been born again. We talk about fire insurance sometimes. Like, I just would like now to live a life knowing that I'm going to heaven, so I've got that fear out of the way and enjoy as much of this earth as possible. Just, and again, it's not always things that are inherently bad. Sometimes it's just comfort, an easy schedule, a lack of pressure, the kinds of things that come when you are actually fighting the good fight of faith. You're going to be inconvenienced. My flesh doesn't like that. You're going to have to, yeah, share the gospel with somebody who doesn't want to hear it. I don't like that. You're going to have to reprove, rebuke, exhort even your brothers and sisters in the Lord, and they might not respond with just gratitude towards you. They might get upset at you. I don't like stuff like that. Um, and so right out of the gate, it was good for me to hear, guard against complacency. You will receive power after the Holy Ghost comes on you, and you'll be witnesses. Mm -hmm. It's not let me give you this baptism of the Holy Spirit that, like we say, you can put as a trophy on your spiritual shelf and brag about it. And whenever it comes up in conversation, you can say, oh, yeah, I had that experience. Mm -hmm. Been there, done that. Mm -hmm. um, so it was, it was a, a blessing right away. Mm -hmm. And then um, a couple more things. <clears throat> when we talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and living full of the Spirit, Sometimes I have to contend with doubt. You know, is this manifestation of the Holy Spirit really the Holy Spirit, or is it just me or somebody else making it up? And then also, what if the Lord does come in and begin to move among us in ways that make me or other people uncomfortable? You know, like, what if he does prompt me to give a prophecy or a, a tongue, and, you know, hopefully he'll give me the interpretation. And I don't want to get embarrassed being those people that pastor has to talk about, you know, like if somebody gives an utterance in tongues and then there's no interpretation or it's that long, awkward silence and it's like, okay, what's going on here? Are we disorderly? And so let's just not mess with it all. And just, it's easier that way. So when you start talking about these things, again, my flesh squirms a little bit because uh, there's this, yeah, potential for discomfort. And 
he talked from Second Timothy chapter 1, where God hasn't given us a spirit of timidity. Mm-hmm. So that in me that has this aversion to the topic that, by the way, God in his sovereignty knew that we needed to hear right now. And my flesh like, uh, do we really need to talk about this? Don't be timid, the Bible says. God hasn't given you a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and a sound mind. And like Steve Golden was saying just a second ago, remember the Lord's love for us. He's the giver of every good and perfect gift. He's not trying to just make you do something that's hard just for hard sake. No, this is a good gift. So my flesh's response of saying, I don't really want to talk about this right now, is wrong. It's carnal, and I'm not going to give place to it. Mm-hmm. And I'm not going to give place to timidity or shying away from this. I'm going to believe, no, this is a good gift from the Father of lights. Yeah. Just like he loved me and saved me, now in my serving him on a daily basis, he says, hey, I want to, I want to bless you. I want to help you and empower you. And that's the perspective that I need to adopt and through which I need to hear these uh, principles that are shared in the teaching. So those are a couple things just right out of the gate that were a blessing to me. Yeah. Timidity takes on a lot of different forms, doesn't it? Uh-huh. It sure does. I mean, there can be the, the self-consciousness of, of wondering what, um, what the Holy Spirit might want me to do if I get filled with him. Uh, speaking out in the service, like you, you say, or, or on the job, maybe, and you're going to offer prayer to somebody, and what if, you know, if the person I pray for doesn't get healed, and what do people think? And, and we don't need to worry about those things, do we? Yeah. No? No? Reach out and take power. Amen. It's unlikely that you're going to lay hands on the sick person and see them healed um, without the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen? Yeah. 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 If, you, um, if you look to the Lord and desire to be used by God in whatever way he sees fit to use you, because the gifts are dealt uh, by the Holy Spirit uh, severally or individually, as he wills. You can't just, you know, drum it on up yourself, but if he he wills to use you, then we want to be available. We don't want to just say, oh, I don't think that's for me, or not now, or maybe under other circumstances. No, not a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power and love and a sound mind. That's a, that's a great combination, isn't it? Yeah, amen. Power, the Holy Spirit, power, and love. Faith works by love. God gives us a genuine compassion for those that are around us in need, a desire to edify our brothers and sisters with a, with a, a, a word that, that would, yes, edify, exhort, exhort or comfort. Um, <clears throat> and a sound mind that, uh, that, uh, that enables us to move past self-consciousness to God consciousness yep. in the bigger picture of what's going on. Amen? Yes. That we're indwelt by God's Holy Spirit, now directed by God's Holy Spirit, prompted by God's Holy Spirit. This is exactly what we pray and desire. And, and God sees fit to use that kind of ministry to bring his life to other people. And, and we can rationally consider this is what's going on. It's not magical and mystical. It is supernatural. But it's the life, it's, it's consistent with the life that we've been called to. Lines up with his word, doesn't it? And so we can look to the Lord, and yes, as different ones have said, we need to be asking. Yep. We do need to be asking. Complacency is a real danger. Amen. It's a real danger. Because we're, we sit here today and we're thankful to the Lord. We sing the beautiful songs of how wonderful it is to know that our sins have been forgiven, they've been nailed to the cross. We're new creatures in Christ Jesus. And when Jesus comes back, we go home to be with him. That's wonderful. Yep. But there's work to do. And we don't lose sight of that. And we need God's power to do that work. Amen. Because not, you know, it's not a given that everybody in this room today makes it to heaven. You know, if I'd made that statement a few years ago, there would have been other people here that aren't here now, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, about whose salvation I'm very concerned. Not a given that everybody here today be here looking for Jesus to return next year. We're trusting the Lord. The Lord uses us in one another's lives to build one another up. The Bible says that prophecy edifies, exhorts, and comforts, Mm -hmm. doesn't it? Yeah. 
which, among other things, tells us that we all need edification, exhortation, and comfort. Amen. That's why God has given that gift and does use that gift as we come together as a body of believers, that his church would be strengthened, purified, prepared for Jesus' return. We should be thinking along those lines. It's not just all about uh, me and mine, is it? Yeah. No, we cannot give place to the complacency, the apathy. There are, there are needs. There's a work that the Lord desires to do. We should be a people zealous of good works. Amen. Zealous. Yep. Just continuing that thought, it's, it's big and real in the heart of any born-again person to seek the well-being of your brother and sister in the Lord. And I'm thankful to observe that among us. Mm -hmm. I, I believe that we want each other to finish the race and to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. And that's very evident. Um, the Lord, it, to, in the interest of building people up, he says, yeah, I do have these spiritual gifts, just to continue that thought a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Um, we read about them in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, especially in the other passages. You know, Romans 12 talks about them, um, perhaps 1 Peter 4. But um, if you want to build somebody up, it's not just you going up and saying something nice like, hey, you're a really good Christian. I just wanted to know I think that of you. I mean, that's a fine thing to do. But the Lord has some supernatural gifts of the Spirit that are for the edification of the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. And that's the God-ordained way to build up the body. That's a primary, a very significant um, reason that God has given the spiritual gifts is for the edification of the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. um, it's good if you're not real familiar with that passage of Scripture, spend some time in it mm -hmm. and covet to prophesy mm -hmm. and forbid not to speak with tongues and look to the Lord, like Dad's saying, to be used in a word of wisdom or word of knowledge or faith or miracles or healing mm -hmm. for the edification of the body as we're busy about this business of making disciples. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. An interesting testimony on, <clears throat> as we're talking about everyone desiring to be used by the Holy Spirit. And you might not be the one to lead the person completely to salvation, but we had a situ situation during camp where there was one, one, of the, one of the ball players just showed just an extreme friendliness. And we're out the, at the passing station there. We're just, you know, you've got seven minutes, nine minutes to take your time and teach them what you can. But it stood out that this child was very receptive. And I remember mentioning to the coaches that same topic. Well, by the end of the week, this child had expressed a desire to know God more, to get a Bible to read about God and who he was and how she could have a relationship with him. And you're just thankful because, as, as, as we were just saying, each person plays a part. Now, I didn't present this child with the Bible. I didn't get to spend much time with him. But again, this child is circling around amongst multiple people, being used by the Holy Spirit to minister to this child. And this child receives from the ministry of this church as a whole. And that's mm -hmm. a blessing to see mm -hmm. every joint supplying as God gives them the ability by the Spirit. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's just a point of obedience to what God has called us to do. And um, like, like this week, I prayed with a gentleman. I think you saw him walking around with a, with a little boot on his foot. His name is Emmett. And, um, uh, and I've gotten to know Emmett from a couple of the basketball camps. And um, he seems to be a brother of the Lord. But one of the things I, he started telling me about his leg, I asked him about his leg. And, and um, I also asked, he told me what had happened to it. And then I asked him if I could pray for him. And, and laid hands on him and prayed. He wasn't instantly healed and um, followed up with him the next day and said, you know, he still trusts in the Lord. But it was interesting, his wife came up and she, um, I met her the following night and she was just two ladies walking up and she happened to ask me and she said, have you, she described her husband and he said she has, he has a boot on his foot and she wanted to know where he was. and. Um, and then I said, oh, Emmett, he's, he's over at the, he's inside the gym, he's sitting down in the chair. And she goes, and I said, said a few other words, I'm not sure what I said, but she said, you must be the one who prayed for him. So he went home and told that testimony to, testimony to his wife, in which was a real blessing. And um, I, I don't know what's going to come of that. I don't. But I do know that when Emmett left yesterday, 
Emma turned to me and said that, hey, I, I, we have our own church, but I, I think we want to come out and visit. So I, I don't know what the Lord's going to do. And those kind of things, you're never sh- sure what the Lord's going to do. Mm-hmm. But when you act in obedience, mm-hmm. God's at work. Mm-hmm. Yep. Amen. Amen. Sons of God are led by God's spirit. And while his voice is not an overpowering, thunderous voice, he's capable of that kind of voice. (laughs) Usually, we hear it in the still small form, don't we? But his sheep know his voice. His sheep know. We can can and should be cultivating a a keen sensitivity to his voice. We would be ready to yield and respond in perfect obedience. Mm -hmm. Sure. It's not uncommon to remind ourselves at the end of any series, hey, just because we're done talking about this in service, don't forget about it. Keep talking about it, applying the principles, things like that. If any of us haven't received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I hope that we don't just forget about it until the next time that we're reminded, Mm -hmm. or if any of us recognize the need to be more filled Ask and keep asking, and don't just wait for, yeah, the next teaching or somebody to come up to you and ask you. You'll get a a gauge to a degree. You'll see how interested you are in it by how much you continue to seek the Lord and and ask. Um, Scripturally, there's really no tarrying for the baptism in the Holy Spirit. People... The, uh, the first instance, they did wait for the day of Pentecost, mm-hmm. about 10 days. But all of the other ones that we looked at through the teachings, mm-hmm. uh, the people were just really filled on the spot as mm-hmm. they listened to the preaching or somebody laid their hands on them and prayed. And um, don't overcomplicate it. I'm not, I'm not trying to minimize the magnitude of what's taking place, but um, just continue to ask, believe, and reach out and take what the Lord mm-hmm. has for you. Um, if you want a, somebody to pray for you, ask. If you're just seeking the Lord on your own, then pray. Um, the Lord can fill you any number of different times, places, circumstances. Mm-hmm. But I would exhort all of us to receive mm-hmm. with the, the promise of the Father. Hallelujah. Who else? Who else? Mm-hmm. Yep. Any questions on that teaching? Were there? Being filled, refilled, uh, tongues, the gifts. It certainly wasn't uh, an exhaustive teaching. Uh, but um, uh, we you know, touched on some familiar uh, points. Seth, please, go right ahead. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd refer to probably Acts 4. Um, you look at the early uh, days, the very early days of the church, and they were out boldly preaching the gospel. Um, but there had been some arrests made. And uh, with um, the saints then gathered, they're praying uh, that... Uh, of course, they, they rejoice that the um, apostles have been released. But they pray that God would grant them with all boldness they would speak his word, that he'd stretch forth his hand and heal and do signs and wonders in the name of, of Jesus. And the Bible says there that the place where they were gathered was shaken and they were all filled. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think you're, to your, your question and the point that you're you're addressing. I think that that is the way the um, the Holy Spirit shows us in the Scripture that uh, that that believers are filled and refilled. We give out in ministry, and in order to give, we need to be receiving. There needs to be a, a continual flow, and 
maybe it isn't continuous. Maybe more rightly, it is continual. That is to say, um, uh, we're looking to the Lord to move in a particular way, or at least ready to be used in a particular way. We're calling out to him, and he moves upon us, filling us, filling us afresh. The disciples seemed like they were very actively about the business of preaching the gospel. It's not like they were backslidden and needed to be really revived. No, they were, they were busy doing the job, but in order to continue to do it, they needed ever fresh infillings and, and revitalization just on an ongoing basis. You know, the, the, um, elsewhere in the scripture, the, the, script, the, the, the word speaks of the power and presence of the Holy Spirit being in us like a well of living water springing up into everlasting life. I don't know that that's necessarily just a, a geyser, you know, but it's just the, the upwellings of the Holy Spirit in us uh, working to bring blessing, really to work the will of God whenever and wherever he sees fit. But we're, we're ever looking to him, uh, desiring the gifts and the, the fresh infillings of his spirit. Yeah. Stephanie. It's, um, it's, it's common in Pentecostal circles for, with, specifically with regards to tongues and interpretation, for there to be an understanding or a belief that, a, that a, an interpretation of a tongue is essentially a prophecy. That is to say, it's speaking to the people um, to uh, edify and exhort and, and comfort the people. It can be, you know, somebody gives an utterance in, um, in tongues, and then the interpretation, or what some would, would classify as the interpretation, comes forth as, thus saith the Lord, the, the Lord desires to do his work in your life, uh, sanctify, consecrate yourself, and allow the Lord of glory to move among you, whatever. But it's to the people. And, um, and the scripture speaks of the, uh, the, the tongues being God word. Jim's probably beaten me to it. He that speaks in an unknown tongue speaks unto God. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Verse, two. Verse 2. That's one. Crack open your Bible there to 1 Corinthians 14. So I was heading up to the other. Uh, the lectern this afternoon, I told Marianne I gotta get myself a new Bible. Too many pages have come loose. <laughs> it's, it's that time that the, the binding is, is about falling off. I can see you through there. <clears throat> Bear with me. I've got to, to be extra gentle in my handling of the Word of God. He says from verse 1, follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that you may prophesy. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. Well, if in speaking in an unknown tongue we are speaking to God, then if there is an interpretation of the tongue, that will be to God. It's, it's unknown, and through the interpretation, it is now known by a supernatural move of the Holy Spirit. An interpretation of what was spoken in unknown is now spoken in a known tongue. For us here, it's English. But if, um, and again, we would not have that had difficulty understanding uh, an interpretation if we were talking of spoken languages. 
if I were over in Kenya speaking to a congregation there and using an interpreter, I would speak in English. The interpreter would hear what was said in English and speak it to the congregation in Kiswahili so that they could understand what I just said. Well, there's a supernatural gift of the Holy Spirit, which is the interpretation of a, of a tongue that was shared with the body for the edification of the body. But it's not, it wasn't spoken unto men, but unto God. And so the interpretation, obviously, we would expect it to be Godward, uh, giving thanks, Exalting, verse 6? Uh, 17. 17, Last thanks. Six, no. Yeah. Uh, for thou uh, verily givest thanks well. In verse 17, in speaking in an unknown tongue. Yeah. Pardon? Follow up? Question, Sheriff, please. Yes, yeah, yes, that is also the case. There's the operation of the gift of the Holy Spirit in a corporate assembly such as this, uh, tongues accompanied by interpretation for the edification of the body, for, for the blessing to the body. In that sense, uh, tongues and interpretation combined are the equivalent of prophecy in their capacity to edify and exhort and comfort the body. You with me there? But they're not the equivalent in that essentially a tongue with its interpretation carries the same communication that a prophecy carries. They both have the capacity to edify the body. But to your, to your question, tongues with interpretation would, would operate in a gathering such as this. Or maybe your home fellowship group meeting. Or maybe just some of the saints gathered at your house for a time of fellowship and somebody has a tongue with an interpretation. And the body is present and the body can be edified. But then there is the, the tongue that we speak in just to edify ourselves. The tongue, that, the, the unknown tongue of, of praising and giving thanks to God. Um, he that speaks in an unknown tongue edifies himself, the Bible says. And, um, and yes, so yes, there's the, the gift of the Spirit. And then there's just generally speaking in tongues that we can do as we're communing with Father in, in our times of, uh, of prayer, praise, worship. Fellowshipping with him. Something to... Much yeah, yep. Yeah. Are there any other... Uh, I could say a few other things. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, yeah, there. sure. If there's anything... Yeah, just, yeah, just continuing that thought, yeah. like here in First Corinthians 14, <clears throat> he's... Um, the emphasis here is on edifying the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. And evidently, you know... The letter of First Corinthians is written as a response to specific questions that they asked and particular needs that Paul was aware of in the Corinthian church. And there was some disorder in their gatherings as people who were filled with the Holy Spirit were speaking in tongues, but it was, it was chaotic sometimes because people are saying things that are not understood by anybody else, and so... As a result, everybody just hears. It would be like somebody in here speaking a language that none of us know. And if they are saying something to God, none of us know that. And so we just hear unintelligible speech. And so Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, goes about setting this in order. And he says, like in verse 5, I would that you all speak with tongues. He's like, I, I want you all to do this. But rather that you prophesied, for greater is he that prophesies than he that speaks with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive the edifying. And verse 18, he says, I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all, but in the church I'd rather speak five words with my understanding, that by my voice I might teach others also, than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. We could spend a long time in the chapter, but there is a distinction if you flip back to 1 Corinthians 12. He lists nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. And tongues is one of them, and interpretation of tongues is another one from that same list. And as you read in context here, the, the gift of the Holy Spirit for the edification of the body is distinct from, just like Dad saying, the 
uh, individual praying prayer and so, uh, yeah, prayer language Jesus that you yes, yeah, so, sometimes uh -huh. referred to. Yep. Yeah, yep. And so Paul says, "Look, I I speak in tongues more than all of you, mm -hmm. but that's different from uh, uh, speaking in tongues in the assembly at a volume that." Uh, clearly communicates that this is an utterance gift. This is something for everybody to hear. Um, the Bible does not teach that it's wrong for someone else to hear you praying in tongues. You know, you're sitting in prayer and praise and worship, and the guy next to you is praying in the Spirit. If he is louder than everybody else in a way that is, like, basically uh, getting everyone's attention so everybody hears, then that needs to be interpreted. And if that's not the case, then he should stay quiet. That doesn't mean that, yeah, you're disorderly if the guy next to you is praying quietly in tongues and you happen to hear him, oh, I heard him pray in tongues, we're out of order. No. Um, but if it's, if the Holy Spirit prompts somebody to give an utterance in tongues, it would be at a volume that everybody could hear, and then we'd expect an interpretation of that. And so we have uh, two distinct things, the prayer language, the speaking in tongues, that is the initial physical evidence of uh, being filled with the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. and then a gift that is intended not just for the individual, but for the edification of the body of Christ that is necessarily accompanied by interpretation. Mm -hmm. There's the passage in Jude to, I hear Pastor Scott yeah. refer to this often. Um, he speaks there uh, in verse 20 of Jude. But ye beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. The exercise of, of uh, praying in the Spirit. Uh, is, um, is a very edifying experience for the individual. Mm -hmm. Praying in the Spirit, building yourself up in the most holy faith. Praying in the Spirit. Again, that's what Paul is referring to, I, I believe, plainly when he says, I speak in tongues more than you all, mm -hmm. nevertheless in the church. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. And he's talking about the times that he's communing with Father, praying in the Spirit while he's walking down the road, heading off to the next city for some meetings, or, or just in the quiet times of communion with Father. Uh, he's praying in the Spirit, building himself up in the most holy faith. But in the church, that's a, a, a different manifestation of a tongue that should be accompanied by the, um, <clears throat> the interpretation. Yeah. To a, a point, and we didn't take a lot of time and talk about the operation of the gifts, um, but uh, Jim breaks up, uh, brings up a matter that I would speak to, and that is the, um, the, the praying in the spirit by individuals when the, the, the body is around, whether it's here in our times before services or up in corporate prayer. Uh, I, uh, we are not expecting silence. No. no prayer is vocal. Um, it doesn't have to be. Uh, vocal. I, I believe that people can pray silently, but uh, prayer is usually articulated, though it can be quiet. And when there are others around, um, there's some kind of consideration given to others being around, so that if, I've, if I've got, uh, if I'm praying to Father and there happens to be people surrounding me, then they don't all have to be listening to me shouting my petitions to God. I can be. Uh, relatively quietly uh, speaking to God about the matters that I wanted to bring before him or praising him. But when we're in a, a room such as this or prayer room or at yeah, times of in our homes, home fellowship group meetings, I mentioned that, uh, there can be uh, prayer in the spirit and not the, and it doesn't have to be accompanied by an interpretation if just individuals are praying in the spirit. I know that a number of uh, a number of times at our home fellowship group meetings, uh, uh, the the person conducting the meeting will see if there are any prayer requests, and will pray for individual needs that are there. And at those times, sure, people are praying in English, and they're praying in the spirit. And if you listened, oh yeah, okay, I hear somebody praying in the spirit, in an unknown tongue. Well, that doesn't demand an interpretation. 
And it doesn't mean that they're out of order because, again, to the point that Jim was making, that they're out of order because other could, others could hear them. You know, that can be, that can be uh, very much a part of our, our corporate prayer without it being a distraction. And um, I've heard over the years, you know, different ones say, well, you know, that's, that's disorderly. Tongues, if there's not an interpretation, then the people are, 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 are to be, keep silent. Well, I don't believe that silent is dead silent. Silent in the church. Right, silent in the church. Yep, I don't believe that that's what's... Mm -hmm, yep. I don't believe that that's what's being spoken to, that, that if there's not the interpretation, then you need to keep silent in the church. No. Silent, I mean, is that like no noise at all? No breathing? No shifting? I mean, where are we going to draw that line? But... Uh, you know, you'll, you'll find some, and I, I, I am of the opinion, and I'll say this is, I believe that it would be more grievous to the Holy Spirit to have somebody critical of the person who's maybe praying a little bit louder than the next person is praying in the Spirit. I, and, and, and so the, the response of one individual is, well, geez, they're out of order, and why doesn't the leadership do something about it? And there should be an interpretation. This is disorderly, and... I think that might have the tendency to be a grief to the Holy Spirit more than the individual who, in their love for Jesus, is praying in the Spirit maybe a little louder than the next person is. You follow me? So we want to make sure and guard our hearts there. Um, if there is something that is out of order, then, yeah, we'll, we'll trust that um, those that are in positions of authority will address it. Otherwise, let's enjoy the presence of God and deal with others, our brothers and sisters, charitably. Again, that's sort of that, 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 uh, that chapter that's sandwiched in between 12 and 14, isn't it? Right? Yes. Yeah, charity. Anything else on, on any other follow-up questions to that with regard to you know, uh, the gifts of the Spirit, or specifically tongues, interpretation, the prayer language? Yeah, please. Just one other quick a reference to that we look to in Acts chapter 2 when they were filled and they were out in the streets speaking in tongues apparently. Again, it was, we do hear them speak the wonderful works of God. Just another one that supports yes. the Godward direction of mm -hmm. tongues. Good, good point. Yeah, yep. Yeah. 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 Uh, what did you do? All spoke with tongues. Yes, Sarah, please. Uh, I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. Kind of going back to the refilling uh, aspect that Steph brought up. I feel like I kind of know the answer, but I'm not sure. Like when you ask the Lord to refill you, because you've already been filled with um, and how do you know that you've been refilled? Is it just a manifestation of fruit? Like, I'm not giving place to this thing anymore? Or cause sometimes in my mind, Mm -hmm. And yet I still give place to this. Or mm -hmm. I'm not doing this or that. Is that like me needing to go back to the Lord? We always need to go back to the Lord. <laughs> yep. Yep. Um, uh, we speak of refillings, but we're not really taught to pray to be refilled. We're not we're, we're taught that, but we see that the, the saints were filled again. And so we see that there is ongoing refilling Though they're not instructed to pray for that, they do pray for that. And again, I refer to, in response to Seth's question, referred to Acts 4. So they were praying, grant with all boldness. Well, we took some time in one of the sessions and talked about how, and I think this maybe in part speaks to what you're uh, asking, uh, the Holy Spirit is given that we might move in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but he is also given to sanctify, to consecrate us, to, to clean us up, to purge and purify, to empower us to be more like Christ. And so we're asking the Father for his Holy Spirit, mindful, however, that, yes, that same power is to be reached out and appropriated by faith. Um, you, you, know, you make reference, Sarah, to the recognized need for the power of the Holy Spirit to change, to conduct yourself in a more uh, godly or Christ-like manner in a particular area. 
and we're, we're looking to the way, praying, asking God for that, for that kind of help. And he gives his Holy Spirit. He does. But we do reach out. We may not, uh, we may, may not pray and find that we're all speaking in tongues again and, um, and prophesying like Acts 4. But we are, by faith, reaching out to appropriate the power that we know we need to do what we know God has called us to do. Steve mentioned, as, he, as we started this afternoon, to be a witness. Convicted that he, he, does, he has a desire, needs to be a bolder witness. Praying to, that the Lord would, would grant uh, power to be a witness, that's very biblical. That lines up with the scripture, doesn't it? And so we would look to the Lord for, for his power. But we don't necessarily find that as we pray, um, we're, we're now prophesying and sense that, okay, I've just been refilled. Now I can hit the streets and witness. Now you, you pray, and you know that the Lord hears your prayer, will give. So, yeah, if that's what you're praying, you might go and look for some folks to witness to. You might um, go knock on a neighbor's door or, or uh, uh, purpose that when I go into that store, I'm bringing with me a gospel track. And uh, before I leave that store, that track's going to be in somebody else's hand. And it's the person that's, you know, buying the cucumbers next to you or the lady that's checking you out. Um, and, uh, and you hand them a gospel track and you say, uh, it was on my heart to tell you that Jesus Christ loves you and that you need to trust him for the forgiveness of your sins and the salvation of your soul. And there, in doing something like that, you're looking, you're looking to the Lord and you're actively reaching out to the Lord to draw on his grace. His power, the power of his spirit to do what you know he's called you to do, what his spirit uh, sup, uh, enables you to do. As it would pertain to, you know, areas of uh, where we're battling with a, um, a besetting sin, for example. Uh, look to the Lord. Man, Lord, I need your grace to be able to get out of bed on time and to do so with a decent, in a decent mood. I get up too late and I'm grumpy when I get up. And um, you're convicted. You, you cry to Jesus for help. Help. And then you draw on that, that grace by faith. Mm -hmm. By faith. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it won't necessarily mean that you just wake up at 5 a.m. praying in tongues, prophesying to your, you know, your, your household. Yeah. But there's power from on high. Yeah. Hallelujah. Anybody else? Derek, sure. Yeah, so I, yep. And I started, you know, speaking in tongues. Yeah. And the stuff is just like so, like foreign and just like so mysterious that you. Unknown know, is the King James unknown tongue. Yeah, unknown tongue. <laughs> yeah, so I'm in the car and I'm just like, I'm going to test this stuff out and I'm just, you know, just going back and just saying it, just saying it, just saying it. You know what I mean? Just, uh, I don't know, because I never, I always seen other people doing it, but you know, I never did it myself. So it's like from the outside looking in type of thing. But one thing I notice is, um, like when I be like speaking in tongues, it's like, like with the human, like with the human language, it's like a lot of words that's in the dictionary. It's a lot of words that's in like the, the source and things like that. So that's how I know that I'm saying like, you know, a lot of words and not like basically, it, it seemed like my, my spirit language is like, like the words are like limited. Like I really don't have like as many, like as many words as like uh, a lot of other brothers and sisters have, like when mm -hmm. they be praying in tongues. Mm -hmm. It don't seem like there is a, like a repetitive type of, um, Let's say speech. You know, sure. saying the same thing over and over. Mm -hmm. But it seems like they're, I mean, of course we don't know what we're saying, but we know what the same type of repetitive sound, you know, actually sure. sounds like. And I want to I wanna say if I am edifying my body, mm -hmm. uh, you know, edifying, yeah, edifying my body, and I'm saying the same thing, that isn't that the same type of edification that I'm giving myself because I'm, I'm saying the same thing over and over. It's not like a new tongue, so I can't touch on like a new topic. Mm -hmm. You know, to go ahead and 
edify myself in in that particular manner? I'm. Or is that like I, me looking too deep, deep into it? Well, um, I, I've um, I've thought along the the lines that you speak to, and I'm going to share a personal perspective, an opinion. Um, I know. Um, and this is, this is sort of opinion, observation, experience. Good there? Yeah. This is not straight from the, from the scripture. Um, I know people that in their relatively quiet personal prayer use very few words. That is, uh, uh, in terms of variety or diversity. Primarily, it's a uh, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, praise you, Jesus, praise you, Jesus, praise you, Jesus. I hear people pray like that. You with me there? Yes. Yeah? Just in times of corporate prayer, I hear people that use very few words uh, expressing thanks and praise to God with a very limited vocabulary in what I'm referring to, very few words. Um, I've thought before that perhaps the same thing or a similar thing takes place when you hear somebody pray in an unknown tongue, and it sounds like they're saying the same relatively few syllables over and over again. Now that's just, you know, uh, an observation and, um, and uh, a theory, but not sure. Uh, there are others, you know, uh, the psalmist David, he used a lot of different words in praising God, didn't he? Yeah? And I hear people pray in an unknown tongue using lots of different words or syllables and sounds. Yeah. And I think that there is uh, quite, uh, I think that's quite commonly observed also. That is, there are some people, and um, uh, I, I, if I hear what you're saying, you know, if there's an interest in expanding your vocabulary, I, you know, maybe ask God. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe talk with God. Uh, yeah, just uh, there's, to my knowledge, the scripture doesn't speak of the extent of one's uh, vocabulary in an unknown tongue. No. So uh, you do know that you build yourself up in the most holy faith, according to the passage we just looked at in Jude. Mm -hmm. And if maybe just an exercise in faith where I've thought along these lines too, believe me, this I'm not trying to make doctrine out of this, but sometimes I've wondered if it isn't... Uh, uh, if it doesn't involve uh, somewhat of an exercise in faith to expand one's uh, vocabulary in tongues. Yeah. You with me there? Yeah. 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 So. I was just, Please. Again, just some of the, the praises that you do see in heaven and angelic beings, they're yeah. The, the scriptural record is relatively short, you mm -hmm. know what I mean, in terms of number of words and vocabulary. And again, not... Holy. Not, yeah, holy, holy, <laughs> holy. Lord God. You know. <laughs> Seriously, yeah. Uh-huh. Yep. Yep. Yeah, so, I mean, just to that point, and again, not that the Bible mm -hmm. says that um, we should apply that to tongues mm -hmm. to support a limited vocabulary in an unknown tongue, but... Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's um, giving thanks well. Yep, speaking unto God, giving thanks well. Yeah. So it doesn't have to be um, for it to be uh, anointed, edifying, blessing. It doesn't have to be lots of, lots of, lots of different diverse syllables. Um, no. Just um, let it be, it, yeah. let it be a, a, a praise that proceeds from the heart. Yeah. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, we're taught to covet earnestly the best gifts. Amen? Amen. And like I said a moment ago, uh, we're taught under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul says, I would that you all speak in tongues. It's a good thing. If, you're not, if, you've, if, if, if you've not been filled with the Holy Spirit, ask God. He will fill you. Amen. He will fill you. Pray and, and, and seek that you'd be filled. And uh, with regards to refillings, Look to the Lord and draw in his grace, the supply of his spirit for the life, the power, the strength that we need, whether it be to move in the gifts of the spirit in our corporate gatherings or 
the power of uh, the Holy Spirit that works through us to be effective witnesses, or yes, the, the power of the Spirit that we need to live, uh, to, to walk in greater manifestations of the fruit of the Spirit, appropriated by faith. Amen? Yes. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit, the promise of the Father. We thank you, O Lord Jesus, that you do baptize us. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that by your working in us, we are endued with power from on high. We desire to live holy lives, God-honoring lives. We know that we do so not by might or by power, but by the Spirit of God, your Spirit, Lord God. Help us, O oh Lord. Teach us to be a people who ask and keep on asking. You're a good Father. You give good gifts to those who ask. You give your Holy Spirit to those who ask. Teach us to be a people who do so with a consistency, with, with fervency. You'd be honored and glorified. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We'll be sure and greet one another in the love of the Lord. God's grace and peace go with you all.